Welcome to episode two of Faced. I cannot believe we're already here. The first month has flown by. My first episode has done so well. Thank you so, so, so much for all of your support and enthusiasm and encouragement and your tech tips. Like I said, I am new to this. I am especially bad at technology and I'm doing it all on my own. And so many of you sent really constructive criticism that I actually very much appreciated. I hope that those of you who are watching this on YouTube or Facebook notice that I have taken your microphone suggestions and I'm now using my microphone in the proper position. So keep them coming, guys. I will incorporate them as fast as I can, but I really appreciate it. Um, the first episode is over 5,500 views and downloads, which is really good. I did some Googling. Looks like that puts it in about the top 10% of podcasts. So I'm very excited. It's always really scary launching something new. You don't know if people are going to like it, if it's going to do well, and you guys just had my back every step of the way. So I am so excited to continue this journey. Thanks for tuning in. Um, episode two is titled, How Government Broke Higher Education. And this is an episode that I knew I wanted to do early on because one, it's always at the forefront of public discourse. It's a really big topic right now. Everybody kind of has an opinion on it. Um, but also, it's, a, it's an issue that actually personally impacts me. I do have student debt. I went to school. I have some regrets. I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, I have some bones to pick. So I'm excited to dig into this topic. Um, and then thirdly, it's a subject matter that I think, yet again, people on the right and people on the left can largely agree upon. It's a really big crisis facing our young adults, facing our society as a whole. It's something that we do need to find solutions and ways to address, but it's something where we're really talking past each other. We really can't seem to agree on what should be done. And I think that a lot of that comes from people who have really good intentions, but who misunderstand the economics, misunderstand or don't know the public policy, the history of how we got here, of what created the problem in the first place. And as I've often said, if you don't understand the base cause of problems, you're going to prescribe the wrong solutions. It's just inevitable. And so today, I want us to dig back into those very things and really try to get a more concrete understanding of what created the problem so that hopefully we can find ways to come together and actually do something to fix it. Uh, that would be awesome. So that's my end goal. First, we'll do a summary. In case you've been hiding under a rock and somehow missed the news that there is a looming uh, student loan budget crisis, student loan bubble, student loan debt that is crushing the hopes and dreams of a current generation of young American adults, there's a big problem. Um, actually, the problem is a bit bigger than I even recognized. I hadn't actually dug into the numbers until I started researching for this, which yet again, guys, I have my notes here in front of me. If you're listening to audio only, you hear some ruffling. That's what that is. I have to have notes. I have so much research and data in here. It's, um, it's a lot. Uh, so first and foremost, the, base, the basic numbers. We have 43 million Americans carrying 1.5 trillion, that's with a T, in federal student loan debt, and another 119 billion in private student loans. That's a lot of money. Uh, the average debt across all years for a person is about $37,172. Um, that's decreased a little in the past year. The average graduate came out carrying just over $29,000 in student loan debt. It takes the average person 21 years to repay their student loans if they repay them. Um, and that hurts our economy as a whole because that's holding those 43 million people back from making other purchasing decisions. That's keeping them from buying homes, from buying new cars, from buying luxury items like clothes or vacations. It's keeping them from saving for retirement. And while some of those things might sound frivolous, frivolous, um, they actually really do tend to create a lag on our economy. You have to remember that for every house that's built, for every car that's created, the, there's a number of jobs being funded for those positions. And if you have fewer people buying those things, that's fewer jobs being created. And so as a whole, it really is not good for our society. Uh, even more frightening, the Wall Street Journal reported that the government is set to lose nearly half a trillion in taxpayer dollars from student loans that can't be repaid. And that's a really big gaping budget hole. It's actually nearly as big as what the banks lost from the subprime mortgage crisis in 08. Um, and we all remember how that went. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, the main driver of this debt is rising tuition costs, which I think is, is pretty popularly known. From 2008 to, 20, to 2018, uh, the average tuition at a four-year public college increased in all 50 states, and on average it went up by about 37%. It's a really big jump for 10 years. Uh, but it's been increasing for some time. Um, in 1978, it cost the modern equivalent 
of $17,680 to attend a private school and $8,250 to attend a public school. Today, in 2020, it would be 48,000 compared to 17,000 to attend a private school and 21,000 compared to 8,000 to attend a public school. That means the costs have risen at a rate three times that of inflation. Do some digging, look at other cost of goods. You won't find hardly anything else where it has had that kind of increase over time. Typically, what you see is the price of a good or a service decreases over time as more providers enter the market, more people are offering um, the good or service as it becomes cheaper and easier to produce. It's, it's rare to see this happen, and typically when you do see this happen, it's for one reason, and it's because the government has gotten involved and screwed up the market. More about that later. Um, not only do college graduates carry a lot of debt, but the jobs they're getting are maybe not worth the expense. That's, that's still up for debate, but uh, there's, some, there's some troubling numbers. The Wall Street Journal reported that on average, 43% of graduates are underemployed in their first job. Of those, roughly two-thirds remain in jobs that don't even require a college degree five years after graduation. Um, another report in the Washington Post shows that only 27% of graduates work in a job related to their major. Now, I remember when I was entering college, I saw that stat and I thought, oh, thank God, I won't be tied to this degree. I'm a bit of a uh, commitment phobe. I was like, this is a good thing. That means I can still pick other career paths down the road. No, girl, that means people can't get jobs in the fields they're paying to go to school for. It's not a good thing. Um, so is a college degree still worth it? That's a debate that's raging. We can have that. I'll probably continue to have that throughout this podcast. But ultimately, there are some numbers in its favor. College graduates do still earn more than those who hold only a high school degree. On average, you're looking at about $78,000 a year for people with college degrees to the average $45,000 a year for people with high school degrees. Uh, but, and this is a pretty big but, I think, the internal rate of return is decreasing. Now, what is the internal rate of return, you may ask? As did I, because I had no earthly clue. But I googled it, and basically it's just a measure that investors commonly use to gauge the profitability of different kinds of investments. So if you're looking at whether or not a college degree is a good idea, it's a good investment, you're having to weigh the negative cost, which are the time away from the workforce, paying for the school itself, the time that you have to devote to obtain that degree, to the potential positive payments that you could receive over time, which is the increase in salary you hope to obtain once you get it. And what the data shows is that the rate of return hovered about 8 or 9% until the 1980s. And then there was a really big boom. It increased to about 16% during the tech boom of the 1980s and 1990s. And it stayed there up until the Great Recession. But since the Great Recession, it actually has been decreasing, and it's around 14% right now. So that's a lot of data to basically say that people who get college degrees are not seeing the rate of return that they anticipated they would see based on what previous generations um, secured. So... I think that that's led to a lot of dissatisfaction around the um, around degrees for people who've obtained them. We can debate all day long whether or not the college degree is still worth it, and I do have very strong opinions on that. Um, but more pressingly, we have a bigger crisis on our hands, and that is that we have over a million people defaulting on their student loans every year, and estimates say that they expect nearly 40% of borrowers to default by 2023. That's soon. That's a lot of defaulting. Um, defaulting basically means these people haven't made a payment on their loan in a year or more. Um, it's really bad to not pay your loans. There's all sorts of really dire consequences. They can take your wages. They can seize your assets. They can um, make it really difficult for you to get credit for anything else. So you want to pay back your loans. They cannot be offloaded. They're one of the few kinds of debt that even if you declare bankruptcy, you really can't get rid of them. There's, there's only a small small window of, of ways that people can get out of them. It's pretty rare. So um, you're stuck with it. So essentially, we have millions of people carrying trillions of debt. They're entering jobs often that don't even require a college degree. Uh, and many are starting to default on what they own. And that's led many, myself included, to warn of a coming student loan bubble crisis um, that could erupt at any time. And for people who don't spend their days in econ books like I do, I just spam to you. But um, I want to define a bubble because I think it's kind of jargon. Um, and I like this definition by Brent Goldfarb. He's the author of a book called Bubbles and Crashes, The Boom and Bust of Technological Innovation. And he says, the easiest way to understand a bubble is to think about a stock that people keep buying mostly because other people are doing the same thing. This usually happens when a company or product has a compelling narrative around it that isn't backed up by data. 
He goes on to say, it would be revealed to have been a bubble if it turns out there was no way to justify the beliefs that it was such a good company. They make for a really good narrative, they're easy to invest in, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future value, and it's often about a lot of novice investors. Novice investors, compelling narrative, um, an investment that may or may not actually be backed up by data, doing it because a lot of other people are doing it around you, that sounds like what's going on with the student loan crisis. Um, as an illustration of bubbles, some people like to use the 2000s dot-com bubble, others point to the 2008 housing bubble, and those are really good examples. Um, but all of these bubbles basically share this in common. They have mass runaway delusion about the value of a commodity relative to its actual worth. And this is why I think you see people paying hundreds, $100,000 to go get a degree in graphic design that might pay them $40,000, even though we have jobs sitting open in the trades that could pay eighty, ninety thousand 90000 without that kind of debt. They're not making very good decisions because there are a lot of false narratives because they're novice investors, they're 18 year old kids, uh, and because they're being told that the pathway to the American dream, the pathway to the middle class, the pathway to respectability is to get a college degree. And I can attest to that. I grew up with that very intense pressure from teachers and parents and people in the community. You were going to college. Like, it wasn't a question of if, it was where are you going and what are you doing? Um, and it was really, I didn't know people who didn't. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to get a degree in. I wanted to be in music. I saw no point in going to college, but I was pressured into it by these narratives. And I think a lot of people come from that position. So what happens if, and I would say when, this bubble burst? Well, most of us remember the 2008 financial crisis, and I think it could be quite similar. During that time period, millions lost their jobs, their retirement savings, their homes, um, and the main cause of that can be traced back to subprime lending in the mortgage industry, and it has a lot of similarities with the student loan bubble. Um, back then, they let borrowers take on more debt than they could afford. That led to an increased demand, skyrocketing home prices. And when the bubble burst, it set off a chain of defaults. People couldn't pay their mortgages. That snowballed. Then the banks couldn't pay what they owed. And it became a recession that impacted everybody. Um, and really, it traced back to risky lending, ballooning debt, and market speculation, which all sound pretty eerily familiar here. Within the student loan crisis, we see students taking out and being given loans with ease. Um, there's little attention paid to their prospective ability to repay those debts, like what is the degree they're seeking? What do these kinds of jobs actually pay when they come out? Um, what is their current credit score? Do they have a history of repaying their debts? These things aren't really looked at. Do you think the free market would behave in this way? Because I'm here to tell you it would not. The only entity that acts like this is the government. In the free market, if I came to somebody and said, hey, I'd like to borrow $100,000 because I'm going to get a degree in women's studies and then I'm going to go write books about women's studies and speak because there's such a demand for people to speak about women's studies. I would, they would look at me like I was crazy. They'd be like, girl, like, you're going to maybe make like $15,000 a year doing that. We're not giving you $100,000. Like, go to the library, read up on gender studies all you want, but that doesn't equal $100,000 degree. Um, that makes it worth it. You know, we just wouldn't see these kinds of things happening. But the government's making really reckless decisions, and we're going to all have to pick up the pieces when this thing comes crumbling down. So I'm pretty pissed about it because it is going to impact you. It's going to impact your kids. Even if you didn't go to college, it's going to impact you. Uh, and as COVID-19 sets in, the situation is really getting worse quite quickly. I think that most people know that. That's why they actually have uh, deferred all student loan payments, federal student loan payments, through the end of the year. I don't know what's going to happen post-December. Um, it really kind of probably depends on what happens with the Senate and the two Georgia runoff races. So to be determined, we'll see. Um, but currently, we've got a pretty dire situation. You know, millennials, which I'm in that age group, we thought we had it bad coming out of college right after the Great Recession. And it did suck. It was hard. There weren't that many jobs. People were getting laid off all the time. Most people who did get full-time jobs weren't getting very good salaries, especially for college degrees. It was difficult to pay back the loans. And this was a situation that almost everybody I knew around me found themselves in. But we actually had nothing on what Gen Z is facing as they come out right now into the worst job market since the Great Depression. Uh, the, the likelihood that these people will be able to pay back their student loans, especially right away, is really, um, is really not good. And so I think this really is a pretty severe crisis that we have on our hands. And I don't want that to get lost here um, because I think to some extent, while I'm going to push back pretty heavily in a minute on some of the responses I've seen called for to this, because I don't think they're the right uh, way to address it, I do think it needs to be addressed. I really have this bone to pick with people on the right 
who often when people on the left propose something are like, no, 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 don't do that. And, and they're right, oftentimes these aren't good ideas that the left are proposing, but then they never come up with their own ideas to push to actually address the problem. And this is a problem. Um, I believe in personal responsibility. I believe that you have to, to take care of what you take on. And, and I think that there is an element to that here. But I also believe people in this situation deserve some sympathy. Um, these are people that were trying to do the right thing. They followed the pathway that was pushed on them by their elders, by their parents, by their teachers, by their mentors, by their sports leaders, by their communities. They've worked hard. A lot of them sacrificed to go to college. They were seeking to do the right thing. These were people who wanted to work. They wanted to contribute to society. They were not attempting to be leeches on society. Um, and I think they were taken advantage of by higher education institutions, by politicians. I think they were misled in their pathways. And I think they were poorly educated by our absolute gutter of a public education system that fails to teach even the basics of financial decisions. And then we let them take on $100,000 worth of debt when they're 18 years old. It's absolutely asinine. So I, I don't think this is something where we just say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get over it. No, there is a social responsibility here that we created a really big problem that needs to be addressed. So with that being said, um, I don't agree with what the left is calling for. They're calling for their usual solutions in response to all of this. They're kind of a one trick pony. All they've got up their sleeves is, more government spending, more of your money to fix the mess we created. Yeah, I don't like it. Um, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeted, student loan debt is holding back a whole generation from buying homes, starting small businesses, and saving for retirement. All things we rely on to grow our economy. Executive action to hashtag cancel student loan debt would be a huge economic stimulus during and after the crisis. Congresswoman AOC said, student loan forgiveness is good, actually. And Representative Ilhan Omar said, abolish student loan debt. She says it like once a day on Twitter. So it's an ongoing, ongoing tweet. Um, not all Democrats go that far, but most do agree on some degree of cancellation. House Democrats this year passed the HEROES Act, which was actually a COVID-19 relief package, but as you typically will see politicians do, they slipped in a whole bunch of taxpayer-funded um, other topics, one of those being student debt relief uh, to the tune of $10,000. Um, and many, including Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, they're urging Biden to take on this proposal when he takes office. For President-elect Biden's part, he has not gone that far. He has not committed to full student loan relief, but he has said that he would like to implement some kind of forgiveness plan immediately. So it remains to be seen what that looks like. And again, it really does depend heavily on um, the Senate. There's some, there's some things he could do unilaterally, but a lot of it's going to depend on how the Senate races go. Uh, while debt cancellation is their approach to the immediate problem, that's also their long-term approach for the longer-term um, situation, too. For some time, Democrats have been in lockstep and calling for free college, free higher education. We see this at both the state and federal levels. And to be honest, the polling's on their side. Um, about 80% of people like this idea. Um, they essentially want to nationalize the higher education market and make tuition at public universities and colleges free. Because that worked out so well in the K-12 model. Just swimmingly. It's going great, guys. No, it's not. Let's review. One in five Americans are functionally illiterate. We rank near the bottom on international math tests among industrialized countries, and our high school graduation rates continue to plummet. Our kids are trapped in failing schools that we're all forced to pay for, even when we don't use them, and even when parents can't use them because they've shut down due to the pandemic and due to outrageous demands by teachers' unions that are holding our tax dollars hostage. Still can't get those monies to use elsewhere. Um, not a good situation. On top of that, the outcomes in our public school system are wildly disproportionate and have extreme socioeconomic and racial disproportionalities. It's disgusting what goes on there. And on top of all that, a, the value of a high school degree has absolutely bottomed out since 1980. So please, yes, Democrats, please apply that model to higher education so you can wreck it to you eternal geniuses. Awesome plan. Awesome. I don't understand how somebody can just keep doubling down on these failed ideas time and time and time again. Like, honestly, if it was your first go around, like, okay, I get it, it's a bad idea, you don't really seem to have a solid grasp on economics, but, you know, I get that you're trying to do the right thing and, like, I see where you're coming from. At this point, there's no excuse. These ideas have failed unilaterally over and over and over again. They keep creating these problems and then they want to come in and take more of our money to try to fix the same problems they created with more of the solutions that created the problem in the first place. It makes no sense. Um, anyways, back to my Back to my point, I'm winded. Um, all free college essentially would do is further deflate the value of college degrees. It would oversaturate the market with degrees, which we already don't need such an overabundance of. 
And it basically would mean that those with those degrees could command lower wages, and it would allow institutions to continue jacking up the price of tuition, which is the real problem here. Um, and on top of all that, it would be doing that on the backs of the working class Americans who don't go to college. About 70% of Americans do not go to college, and yet we want to ask them to pay for the 30% higher education degrees. Doesn't check. Doesn't wash. I'm mad about this because it is a willful ignorance. I don't think it's that hard to look at how these um, policies have played out in the past and to um, re-navigate where you're going for next steps, and they're not doing that. And so it's frustrating, even though I do think they have good intentions. Very, very, very bad economics. Very bad incentives. Very bad public policies. And these things hurt people. At the end of the day, they wreck lives. It's, it's not a small matter here. I really do think that, that these um, ideas and approaches will harm all of society. Uh, but in order to really look at what created the problem for those who aren't up to speed, as the politicians proposing these approaches should be, um, I want to go back in history a little bit and kind of look at a timeline. So let's start in the early 1900s. No surprise here, college used to be really cheap, far cheaper. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we had fewer than 1,000 colleges across the country and about 160,000 students among them. They were mostly a place for aspiring politicians, the wealthy, and ministers who would be dispersed to provide rural to rural areas to provide strong community leadership. Um, many professions, including things like the law, did not require a college degree. Those were rather obtained through things like apprenticeships, you know, where you go and actually uh, observe the actual practice and really get a skill set and get paid to do it. You know, it's a far more ethical way of preparing people for the career fields that they're trying to get into, but we've pretty much outlawed those. Uh, the Great Depression hit higher education hard. State schools depended on grants from the legislature that were no longer available because the funds dried up, and private schools were relying on endowments, which also started to dry up because people didn't have money for philanthropy. So in response, they did this really novel thing where they closed, consolidated, or cut cost, which is just this weird little thing businesses do when they don't have a free piggy bank of tax dollars to rely on. It's kind of amazing. Um, anyways, higher education was left out of the expansive crony government New Deal of the 1930s, as it was seen as far too elitist. Yeah. Uh, in 1944, Congress passed the GI Bill, which extended tuition and living expenses to veterans who had served in wartime. This legislation opened up higher education to men who would have otherwise had to enter the job market upon their return. And it was wildly successful. They had over 8 million veterans enroll under this program, which was about 10 times more than they anticipated. So it drastically rewrote the landscape of public education and of higher education across the country. Uh, the sudden increase in demand led to states devoting more of their budgets to public colleges and universities to expand their services. And this was notably possible in the, post, in the booming post-war economy, because they had a lot of extra revenue that they could spend in this way. So they did. Um, next, the country spawned the National Defense Student Loan Program, which later became the Federal Perkins Loan Program. And this basically did for civilians what the GI Bill did for veterans. It opened up a way for people who otherwise would not have had the time to take away and the money to take away to go attend college to do so. Um, next, under Lyndon B. Johnson, Congress passed the Higher Education Act of 1965, and that set up federal scholarships and low interest loans for college students. And then in 1978, Congress passed a bill known as the Middle Income Student Assistance Act, and this legislation made all undergraduates eligible for subsidized loans and Pell Grants. So you had a couple really big pieces of legislation that just entirely rewrote what the higher education model looked like. And as a result of these policies, universities began to raise their fees to take advantage of all the free money. Duh. Why would they not? Like, this is just common sense. Do you know human nature? Have you observed just how people interact? Like, it's so predictable. <laughs> of course they did that. Um, but this is called the Bennett Hypothesis. It's named for a former education secretary who believed that more government aid for students would lead directly to college cost increases. And now I have to do something I thought I'd never do. But I have to quote the Federal Reserve. Because they have a statistic that really backs up that hypothesis. They found that for every dollar in student aid, tuition goes up by about 65%. So that Bennett guy is pretty on the nose. Um, from 1980 to 2018, the cost of an undergraduate degree rose 213% at public schools and 129% at private schools. So why did college become so expensive? Well, I'm going to argue that tuition rates was rising quickly because of the increase in demand. 
basically what we saw was a run on college educations. All of a sudden you had millions and millions of people seeking these degrees. Um, and just to give one stat, according to the Department of Education, U.S. colleges expected a total of 20.4 million students in the fall of 2017, and that was a 5.1 million increase from 2000 alone. So it's not just from the 1970s to now that we've seen a really great increase in demand, from even 2000 to now. It's just consistently going through the roof. Um, and I think this is an important place to stop and teach a very basic rule of economics, which is the rule of supply and demand. Uh, economic principles are one thing I want to kind of sprinkle throughout these episodes. I think it's so important to have a strong understanding of them if you really want to be able to come up with good, sturdy policy solutions because they're immovable. Um, and I like to think of them kind of like the rule of gravity. They're inescapable. You don't have to like them, but they're not going anywhere. And if you ignore them, you're going to pay the price. So it's really vital that you have a grasp of these. And supply and demand is um, pretty much the first thing they teach you in economics. It's really quite simple. And essentially what it says is that if somebody is offering a product at a certain price, there will be a certain number of people at that price who think that that product is worth it. And if there's a lot of people who think it's worth it, it's going to have a stronger demand. And so you're going to see these two things start to really play with each other and move. But they're related to each other and they can't really escape each other unless the government gets involved. So in this scenario, when you have a college degree and the colleges are offering it for, let's say, $10,000 a year, you're going to have a certain number of people who will want to purchase it at $10,000 a year and who will think that it's worth that value. But if colleges raise their rates to, let's say, $60,000 a year, of those people that were originally going to purchase it, you're going to see maybe eight drop off because they can't afford it anymore or because they don't find it to be uh, worth that amount of money and they're going to walk away from that situation. But what happens is when the government gets involved and falsely increases demand, which is what happens when they offer free student loans for people where they're not having to actually pay out of their own pocket, colleges are able to raise the price of tuition far above what the law of supply would typically um, be able to provide for. People wouldn't typically be able to pay $100,000 out of their pockets to go get these degrees. And so they would have to lower their prices if they wanted to attract more people to purchase their products. But because the government's gotten involved, it's totally screwed the pooch on this entire situation. And that's the only reason tuition has been able to go to the place that it is. It really traces back to the government. Essentially, demand has been falsely inflated by an untrue narrative that Americans must attend college to be successful, and by government loans that allow people to buy what they cannot afford. It's really, really messed with the economic picture. Um, there's a couple other reasons that, that schools are expensive. One, they just are expensive to run. I mean, it's just the basic facts of it. If you're trying to recruit uh, and pay highly educated people to teach others, you've got to have a pretty good budget to do that. But a typical school in 1970 spent about 40% of its budgets on professor salaries, and nowadays that number is 30%. So that doesn't really actually account for why these tuition prices are going up 37 something percent over 10 years. Um, other estimates say about two-thirds of their budgets go to student advocates, which are things like healthcare services and counseling, dormitories, um, campus facilities. And then there's also the cost of living, which has been increasing for all Americans across the country quite steadily for some time. And because many students choose to go to school away from home, because they choose to live um, outside the home, or because colleges require many people to live on campus their first couple of years, a lot of people who are going to school incur secondary housing um, expenses, and a lot of people fold that into their loans. So that does contribute. And then lastly, and this is what many people on the left will point to, states have also cut funding to state schools. And the left will say this has led to a rise in tuition prices. In fact, they'll say that's the only reason that we've seen such a great increase in tuition prices is because states have decreased what they're paying and now they've passed it on to the consumer. But I would argue, if that's the case, we were paying for it anyway, so one, so what? But if you actually dig in the numbers, I think your story falls apart. Um, in the 2015 to 2016 school year, appropriations for full-time enrolled students were 11% lower than 10 years before the Great Recession. Um, and the Great Recession did greatly contribute to people, to states cutting their budgets because they had to fund their essential services and they were hard up for cash. Um, but it doesn't actually explain the entire jump um, because it's been occurring long before the recession and before those cuts started. And if you look at the nine states that have actually increased per student funding since the Great Recession, which would be New York, Montana, California, Alaska, Wisconsin, Hawaii, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Illinois, we still see that the public universities have increased their tuition in all of those states, despite an increase in state spending. So that just doesn't wash, doesn't check out. Uh, a Harvard study that compared higher education programs that accepted federal aid to those that did not 
actually found that tuition at aid accepting programs grew much faster. So all evidence points to government subsidization as the real culprit behind skyrocketing tuition costs. Um, canceling student debt or making higher education free would do nothing to solve any of these problems. In fact, as I just made the case, I think that they would allow schools to continue jacking up their prices. Um, but these policies are also really regressive. Uh, they disproportionately benefit the wealthier uh, and the relatively privileged at the expense of citizens who have less affluence. Remember, only one in three adults over 25 has a degree from a four-year institution, and those graduates have substantially higher incomes on average. Yet their plan is to ask those people that aren't getting a college degree to pick up the tab for Americans getting a college degree. Like, what? That's, you're like the opposite of whatever Robin Hood was. You're going to rob the, like, working class to pay for the wealthier class's school? I am so confused. Who do you work for? Who's asking for this? Like, I just, the party of the working class wants to take, I don't, it just doesn't wash. I am so confused. I never think wealth redistribution is a good idea or ethical or wise, but like, especially not when it's going in the opposite direction. I just, I'm lost. I'm lost. Um, but on top of that, Again, I want to go back to this main point. These people and their policies created the problem in the first place. Crazy tuition prices are a result of their meddling in the market, and now their solution is more government intervention and public resources to address the problem they created in the first place. Please sit down. No. Like, no. We're done here. Um, furthermore, why would, do we want to reward bad behavior by the higher education institutions with more free public money? Because I don't. I think these people ought to be more on the hook for what they've been doing, which is largely peddling worthless degrees for over a decade. I actually loved the Trump administration's plan that said that these colleges and universities should be more on the hook if borrowers who attended their facilities were not able to obtain jobs within a certain amount of time, defaulted on their loans. They should have to pay back some of that to the, to the government. They should be on the hook because they're selling crap that doesn't actually have value. They're misleading people, and I think that they shouldn't get away with it. I also think the model would push them to offer better career services, which I can tell you anecdotally are atrocious. These schools are doing very little to actually try to place their students in jobs these days. It's quite pathetic. They take their money and then they just kind of hang them out to dry. So the last thing I want to do is give them more money, let them continue raising their tuition prices. Absolutely not. Non-starter. Uh, college degrees are already decreasing in value because the market is oversaturated and because many of these degrees are not really required for any known career path. All that subsidizing higher education would do is further saturate the market. Again, you go back to supply and demand. If you have too much supply, the demand is going to decrease. The amount that people can charge, the amount they can ask for in wages will decrease. This isn't something to in any way fight inequality or to improve our economy. It's quite the opposite. The reality is we only need so many college majors. We actually need a lot more people to pursue other pathways currently. So it's just the wrong direction. So now that I have completely just like torn apart all of their proposals, I do want to do what I said, which I, I think when we do push away one side's proposals, we need to come up with others on our own. This is a problem that does need answers. Um, and I think there's quite a few things that we can do to address this. And I think these are, these are ideas that I would like to see and think that people across the aisle could come together on. Uh, and the first one is we need to fix our culture. So often when we have a big problem like this, we look to government for all of the solutions when really politics flows downstream from culture. We need to fix our culture. Why do we demand college degrees for too many fields? Why have we made that our metric for evaluating whether or not somebody's a hard worker, whether or not they have the skills that we obtain? It's a really, really dumb, lazy way of evaluating people. We've seen many employers already start to do away with that on their job applications. I know my company does that. I work for a criminal justice reform nonprofit. Why do we care if you have a college degree? I don't care. You're going to know more about that field if you've actually been impacted by the justice system. If you've been on the ground, if you've been in impacted communities, then you're going to know if you went to a four-year university. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I think that that's something people can just choose to do. If you're a, a business owner, if you're an executive director, if you're a boss, just remove it. Just find other ways to evaluate people and quit pushing everybody to have to jump through these hoops just because you did. I think that's a really bad thing in our society where we have this attitude oftentimes. You see this with around immigration too of like, well, I had to go through this and do this, this, and this, so these people should have to go through hell too. No, stop. Make it better for people who come up behind you. If somebody, if there's a, if there's a job that really requires these skills in college that people would get, like an engineering degree or a medical degree, then fine, go to college and get that degree and require it. 
but for so many other fields, it's absolutely not necessary. And I would actually argue that a lot of people come out of college with less skills than people who've been working. I know I did. When I came out of college, I went to a top 10 business school in the Southeast, went to a very expensive private school, had a great resume, had done lots of internships, and I didn't know Jack. Like I remember thinking, I am so unprepared for the job market. I don't even know to, how to begin looking for a job, what kind of job I should look for, how much money I should ask for. I, I really felt totally inadequate. And thankfully, I had a lot of grit and I worked really hard and I was able to like pull myself out of that. But I would say there's a lot of people coming out of college in those positions where they've paid for a four-year degree, but they actually don't know um, how to enter the job market and don't really have the skills always needed. And that's a big problem. Um, second solution, the laws need to change. So many of our laws and regulations have been put in place by special interests working hand-in-hand -hand with government to try to block new entrants from a field so that they can keep their prices artificially high and block competition. That's wrong. That's bad. That's not capitalism. That's not free market. That's cronyism. It's corrupt. It hurts people. It puts people out of work. It needs to end. And these are things that could largely end at the state level. So I would be banging down my state senator and state representative's door. I want to know what they're doing to actually eradicate some of this. Um, one example, why do people have to go to law school? They didn't used to. There's no reason. They should be able to go read law, work with an attorney, actually get practical on the on the ground knowledge, actually really get a robust kind of resume behind them, get some real life practical experience, take the bar exam, and then go into work. Why do they have to pay an institution for three years? It's a crony scheme. It's BS. It's It's absolutely ridiculous. We need to get rid of these laws and regulations. Um, third approach, we need to elevate trade schools. This was something that wasn't done when I was growing up and I wish it had been because trade schools are awesome. I toured one a few years ago when I was working for a free market think tank in Nashville and I was flabbergasted. It was amazing. It was state of the art, top technology. There were so many things you could do. Like I wanted to go just to get a secondary skill set. It was, it was phenomenal. I always pictured trade schools as like welding or carpentry and they did have those, but they also had things like building veneers for people's dentures. They had, you know, learning to use 3D printers. They had people getting nursing degree programs. It was really cool. Um, and these can also often be obtained far cheaper. The average cost for a trade degree is 33,000. And that's about one semester at a private college. Um, and they usually take about two years compared to four years for a four year degree. Many of these jobs start at 60K and can easily go up to 95, even over $100,000. There's abundance of openings in most states, meaning workers can demand higher pay and better perks. And they also can actually lead to starting your own business far easier than a lot of college degrees, which I think is the dream. Um, another, another solution is cutting costs, both on the college end and on the student end. Uh, while spending on instruction has decreased 4% at colleges, admin costs have increased 13%. Um, so they could cut costs by lowering bloated salaries, reducing administration costs, building more cost-effective campuses, cutting student services, which can include everything from like safe sex kits to free healthcare. Colleges don't need to be doing all that. Teach people, help them prepare for their workforce, and that's it. Um, colleges could end requirements for students to live on campus, purchase their meal plans, or buy ridiculously priced books for their curriculum. Uh, and then students can cut costs on their end by choosing to live at home, they can pick cheaper options like state schools or trade schools or tech schools for their general education requirements and then transfer into four-year schools. And they can take advantage of things like lottery programs in their states that often offer free assistance with tuition. Um, the next proposal is my favorite, and it's not mine. My dad came up with this, and he just casually mentioned it to me in the car the other day. And I was like, Dad, that's, yes, that's genius, because I, I don't know, maybe I'm missing an action on this one, but I've heard nobody else mention this proposal, and I think it's brilliant. So Don Cox. You're on it. He said we should cut interest rates. Duh, why didn't I think of that? Of course we should. Like, that's such an obvious solution. Um, undergraduate interest rates are currently 4.53%. Graduate loans are about 6.08%. Direct plus loans are 7.08%. And there's percentage fees attached to all of these. This makes it really hard for people to pay back their loans because there's so much interest on top of it that they're also having to pay before they even start paying on their principal. This is a really fair, great approach. The government could easily cut the interest rates, make it easier for the borrowers to pay down the principals. It would be fair to everybody. It would help those who've taken out the, lo the loans get some needed relief. It wouldn't force taxpayers who didn't go to college to pay for those who did. People and the government would still make a return on their loans, just a decreased one. I just think there's so much to like about this. Dad, great job. I love that idea. 
Um, and then I think we should end student loans at the federal level. I just don't think this is something government should be doing, period. They shouldn't be in this business. It makes no sense. Um, the free market can determine who should get loans. They can better evaluate and, and value who would actually um, be entering pathways that would pay for themselves, who actually is more likely to pay back the loans. This is a better way of, of securing that, or schools could offer those kinds of programs, better um, scholarships and philanthropy. I just don't think the government should be doing it. And if you did remove the government, it would force schools to reduce tuition, consolidate or close, which many of them should because they're not good institutions. They should shut down. And a lot of them should have to reduce their tuitions. If you got rid of federal student loans, the number of people who could come pay $30,000 for a year of school would be minimum to none. I mean, like maybe the top 1% of people in our society would be able to do that. They can't stay afloat with the top 1% of society as students, so they'd have to rate, they'd have to lower, excuse me, their tuition rates, and they should have to. I think they should be forced to. Uh, and the reality is degrees like songwriting, gender studies, dance, philosophy, these things shouldn't exist, or they should be extremely rare, and in a real market, they wouldn't. I think those are skills you can obtain elsewhere, or they're subjects you can learn on your own without paying $100,000 to do so. Um, and then the last thing is what nobody really wants to talk about, but I will I will put it in there, and that is personal responsibility. I think there is still an element to that. Um, trust me, I would love to have my student loans wiped out. More importantly, I'd love to have the student loans my dad paid for me wiped out because he paid for most of my college, and I have a lot of guilt around that. But as a whole, I don't think it's right or ethical to ask the public to do that for me. I took out the loans. I made a bad decision, and it's my job to pay it back. Um, there's things you can do. You can work multiple jobs. You can make a payment plan. You can move home for a little bit, which I know is frowned upon, but a lot of college kids could do that right after, live home cheaply, work their first year, and make major dents in their payments, and cut costs elsewhere. My friend and editor, Brad Palumbo, has been writing significantly around the student loan um, cancellation proposals this month. You can find his writing at the Foundation for Economic Education. And he had a piece that had a stat in it that um, I thought was really good. He found that the average student loan payment is between $200 and $300. So it's doable. It's not fun, but you can pay that back. That, that's something that most people can do and should do. Um, and what you can do is help others behind you make better choices. I can't tell you how many young girls run up to me when I'm speaking at an event like, oh my gosh, you went to Belmont University. I want to go there. And I'm like, do not give that institution another dime. Here are all the other ways you could get the same degree and have a far better experience and pay less money. Don't go there. I don't do it. Um, and that makes me feel good because I feel like I'm sticking it to Belmont. Um, but as a whole, you know, we have to really pick up the pieces from where we're at now and try to make a better landscape for those moving forward. And I think those are the proposals that would actually start to create real meaningful differences. They'd be fair, they'd be equitable, and I think that there are things both the left and right should get together on. So hopefully you start doing that. Um, that's it, folks. That's episode two. Um, if you like the episode, please share it. That is so helpful to me. Put it far and wide. Tell your friends post on your social media, share it in your blogs or emails, whatever's convenient, just help get out the word. That really goes a long way. Um, you can also rate and review it on iTunes, which only takes a couple seconds. You can leave a nice comment, which boosts engagement. You can also leave a mean comment, which boosts engagement, but I'd prefer you not because it hurts my feelings. Um, a lot of you asked for sources and links on the last episode, and I'm assuming you'll want them for this one. What I've decided to do is after each episode, I'll be writing up a corresponding article at the Foundation for Economic Education, where I'm a fellow. So you can head over to their channels and find last month's write-up, which has all of my links and data. And I'll have one coming out on this subject in the next couple weeks as well. So check there. And then lastly, you can follow me on Twitter at HannahCox7, um, on Facebook at Hannah Danielle Cox 7 or if you want to donate to the show, which I've had a lot of people asking how they can be supportive, you can sign up for my Substack account, which is sort of like um, my path, Petra, Patron, Patron. Oh God, I don't know how you say it. Uh, the Substack is hannahcox.substack.com. You can do a monthly, yearly, or founders level membership there, and that's a great way to support my work. Remember, episodes will be released on the last Monday of every month, so look for us here again on Monday, December.